Hey guys, Claire here, and in today's video, we're going to talk about all things Harry and Meghan. Now, Harry's book, Spare, has made it to the Goodreads list for most popular books of the decade. So if you enjoyed Spare and you are a book reader, perhaps you'd like to check out the list of some of the books included. Now today we found out that Prince Harry's case against the Mail on Sunday will be moving forward. Well, Prince Harry and six other people now have permission to go to trial against Associated Newspapers, the publisher of the Daily Mail. In February, ANL, Associated Newspapers, tried to knock this case out by saying two things. Firstly, that the seven had run out of time to make their claim that their privacy had been breached. You have six years under British law, and this stuff goes back, uh, uh, well, in, in many cases, a decade or more. Uh, and the second thing that ANL tried to claim was that uh, the claim was based on a bunch of receipts for payments to private investigators who are alleged to have carried out this unlawful information gathering that were disclosed to the Leveson inquiry in 2011 into press standards. And uh, the, the uh, Associated Newspapers said that that was confidential information only disclosed for a public inquiry and shouldn't be allowed to be used. Now, the judge has decided in favour of the seven on the first point, on the time limit. And he said this, that uh, they, they have a reasonable, a real prospect of succeeding in proving that associated newspapers deliberately concealed what was going on in their newspapers as regards uh, illegal or unlawful information gathering. Now, he hasn't decided that happened, that they did dis conceal it, but he's saying that if it goes to a trial, they have, a, uh, as I said, a real prospect of succeeding. So he's allowing the case to go to trial. So not only is this great news for Prince Harry, Elton John, and the other claimants, but it also seems to encourage others to hold the tabloids accountable for possible illegal activities. It destroyed my life, my family's life. Heather Mills knows she was hacked by other newspapers. It was absolutely horrifying. I think the only reason I survived it was because my child was very young at the time. Now she too is considering legal action against the publisher of the Daily Mail. On the basis of the great news today, the, the claimants can go to the next stage as I will be making a claim as well as some members of my family that we believed were also hacked and uh, had incredible intrusion in their lives, as we did with the sun in the mirror. And uh, we're really proud of people like Prince Harry and um, Selton John and Sadie Frost for being brave enough to go forward with these claims. Now this past week we got to see glimpses of Prince Harry and Meghan having fun with friends, enjoying a date night out, and also engaging in philanthropic work. We first saw them at the Katy Perry concert with Meghan's longtime friend and her husband. And we also saw or heard a very enthusiastic response from the concert goers. We got to see a video or a photo of Harry and Meghan chatting it up with Katy Perry's dad and also see a little video of Harry and Orlando Bloom uh, taken in the show. We even saw photos of them with other celebrities from the Montecito, Santa Barbara area who uh, were also attending the concert. We also got to see Prince Harry deliver a stand-up comedy style speech for the Stand Up For Heroes sold out show. Prince Harry was in good company. Lots of big names in Hollywood were also a part of the event. Now, of course, the girlies across the pond were triggered by the fact that Harry did not wear his coronation pins. Uh, yeah. 
and also triggered by the fact that he overshadowed King Charles's Parliament speech and also William's Earthshot Prize event in Singapore. Now, if Prince Harry giving a three and a half minute speech from the garden of his Montecito estate in an entirely different continent can overshadow the parliamentary proceedings of the current king and the engagement of the future king in Singapore, that really shows that the state of the British royal family is far more frail than the royal reporters would have us believe. No wonder they keep talking about Harry and Meghan. They bring in the attention. Now, in last week's video, we briefly talked about Charles refusing to apologize for the British government and British monarchy's uh, past transgressions in Kenya. And one of the videos that I added last week, there was just a little snippet of one of the presenters saying that some of the locals could not protest the way they wanted to during Charles's trip which was very interesting. But then soon after we saw articles coming from Kenya about some shady stuff going on during Charles and Camilla's trip to Kenya, which possibly included some segregation amongst the local media and the royal reporters. I don't know if President William Ruto means it because he said so many things and I can't locate him these days because the things he said during election and the things he's doing now are two different things. I don't know. Because I heard him saying we need to do away with the dollar and build our own currency but his actions are not speaking to anything of doing away with the dollar. The latest being putting a red carpet for a man, a person who killed the Kenyan people coming into this country, receiving a red carpet and being saluted by our own army. This is not a Kenyan army, it's not a colonialist army. The Kenyan army is a product of the Mau Mau rebellion. And those who killed our people in the Mau Mau rebellion cannot be saluted by the same army of the children of those who were killed during Mau Mau rebellion. We have a duty to stay true to the cause. We have a duty to remind the king and Britain of what they did to us. Indeed, he shows no remorse. He says this was bad, it shouldn't have happened. But he runs short of, I apologize. I am sorry. He will never say he is sorry for because he thinks that his race makes him superior and he's not qualified to apologize to those who are junior to him. And like clockwork, the UK media attempted to distract from the growing story of the possible messiness of the Kenyan trip. And of course, they had to use Harry's name to distract from that. But this time around, Harry hit back. One of Harry's representatives reached out to American media saying, well, I did not snub him and his party because... I didn't even know there was a party, nor did I get any invitation. So when I saw these headlines earlier today, today's Monday, about how Prince Harry is snubbing King Charles, who did invite him to his 75th birthday, but ungrateful Harry has declined to attend. Like when I saw these stories painting this as a snub, I was like, okay, I'm, we're not doing this today. And you know what? Some days I'm really proud of how far I've come in the royal media literacy sphere. Because it was not but three hours after I saw those first headlines that they got corrected swiftly by none other than an official spokesperson for Harry and Meghan, who, when asked for comment, replied, actually, we never got an invitation. There has been no contact regarding an invitation to His Majesty's upcoming birthday. This is completely false. It's being misreported, i.e. it's being made up. I don't really know where the UK media gets off thinking that they can continue to print lies about Prince Harry when he is no longer bound by the invisible contract. That was the entire point of the documentary and the book. But you've heard me say this before, right? Harry and Meghan, they get the most clicks out of the entire royal family, which is why these stories will never stop. 
So much of the reporting from palace sources tries to paint this picture of Charles as being so hurt that he's not in touch with his grandchildren anymore. He's not having Harry and Meghan at these palace events, but this goes both ways. It's not a snub for your son not to attend your birthday party if there has been no invitation for him to attend your birthday party. You know who didn't comment on this birthday party story and bother to correct it? Buckingham Palace, even now after Harry and Meghan's spokesperson has corrected the story. We see you. Never complain, never explain, unless it's, oh, I don't know, about Kate getting Botox or hair extensions. Then we can complain and explain. And like, I don't even want to get in the weeds on what's going on with this birthday party because that's not the point here. The point is that the British media needs to get used to the fact that they are no longer playing the game that they were a few years ago. Printing made up crap about Prince Harry is going to get corrected and I am all here for it. Now on to the philanthropic sightings of Harry and Meghan. We also got to see them at Camp Pendleton and of course Meghan wore a beautiful little embroidered poppy sweater which of course sold out but it was so heartwarming to see Harry and Meghan engaging with the veteran community and not just veterans, but veteran family members as well. Now, of course, you know, the royal trolls online <laughs> were up in arms about anything and everything related to Meghan this week. They were mad that she wore a poppy, even though people all over the world wear poppies. They were mad that she was standing in front of Harry, even though the other woman there was also standing in front of the men. <laughs> Insanity. The little video clip of the grandpa being so excited to see his daughter and his grandchildren meeting Harry and Meghan was so sweet. They're talking to the prince. My family is talking to the prince, guys. Oh my God. Can this happen any better? My God. Oh my God. Oh my God. <laughs> I'm losing my mind, girl. I'm losing my mind. He's hanging out with my family. Is that your family? He's hanging out with my, they came up to my kids and my grandbabies. Is this amazing, guys? Now we also saw Harry and Meghan at the opening of a new U.S. Navy fitness facility, which has been all over the news. This week I feel like I've seen news about what Harry and Meghan have been doing from Bangkok, from India, France, I mean global. Now there was a particular tweet um, by a user <laughs> on Twitter who I enjoy reading his comments and I wanted to share it with you guys and let me know what you think. So he basically says, attacking Harry and Meghan's every move is essential to some because they want to distract people from the fact that royals don't actually need to be taxpayer funded to do what they are supposed to be doing. Anyone can do philanthropy and associate with aid organizations. There is no exclusivity to service and duty. Service is universal. You find a cause that needs support, it aligns with you and your views, then you launch yourself behind it. You talk about it, you give it your all, that's all there is to it. Now in alignment with the sentiments expressed in that tweet, I have to say that many of the patronages that Harry and Meghan are a part of continue to thrive. They continue to grow because Harry and Meghan are very active right? They always show up. They're always bringing awareness and attention to the causes. But most importantly, they help to make sure that these charities and organizations secure the finances, which is one of the most important aspects of running charitable organizations. So apart from Harry's promotion with the African Parks, uh, this week we also found out that he has been elevated to the global ambassador for Scotty Little Soldiers. And for those of you who don't know, Scotty's Little Soldiers caters to bereaved children who have lost parents in the line of armed forces services. Again, just another organization that Harry supports that is deeply involved in making sure that the mental health of not only veterans, but veterans' family members who are equally affected by their service is tended to. When the UK media started pushing the story that 
poor, sad Charles had invited Harry to his birthday party, and Harry heartlessly snubbed him, I was already side-eyeing it for multiple reasons. We know not to believe anything the tabloids print. They don't report the news, they create the news, right? But especially ones like the Sunday Times. Byline just told us in their article about the palace leaks that the Sunday Times is one of the go-to mouthpieces for that family. Also, we have seen this narrative before. The poor neglected grandfather who just wants to see his grandchildren was pushed hard around the coronation. Even with common sense telling us that planes fly both ways, phones call both ways, and even a 90-year-old Queen Elizabeth could work Zoom. So initially, I thought that this was the tabloids recycling yet another story we have heard before. However, a spokesperson for Prince Harry corrected the record with a statement first to the messenger and also to people saying that there has been no contact regarding an invitation to Charles's upcoming birthday, and it is disappointing that the Sunday Times has misreported the story. I in no way believe that this story was a rogue reporter who came up with the idea and decided to run with it. I absolutely think that it was leaked from the palace intentionally. This story and all of those like it are written specifically to change public opinion on Charles and Harry. This is the same tactic that they used years ago when they wanted to change public opinion on Charles. Harry wrote about it in spare. Stories about a rebellious, drug-addicted Harry who Charles had to take to rehab were sold to gain sympathy for Charles. Charles would then be seen as a struggling single father who was doing his best to raise this difficult teenager instead of the adulterer who abused Diana until she died and then neglected his boys. And honestly, that tactic worked for Charles then, so it does make sense that he and his comms team would try to use the same tactic now. There's no doubt that Charles's reputation has fallen over the past few years, particularly when it comes to Harry, and certainly with the release of Spare. So what we're seeing pushed is a very similar narrative with a few additional players. Harry is still the rebellious, difficult son who is snubbing his elderly father, and poor Charles is the distraught victim. Also, the palace and the royal Rhoda know that if they want a story to get traction, they just need to put Harry and Meghan in the headline. Very few people knew, or frankly cared, that Charles's birthday was approaching. But tying the story to Harry gets clicks, makes money, and gets Charles the attention he so desperately craves. Both the Rhoda and Charles get what they want out of the invisible contract. But this is an excellent example of how the Palace PR and comms teams are not keeping up. For decades, they were able to brief the press any story they wanted, the press would print it, and the public believed it. This happened with Diana, a teenage Harry and William, and even into their adult years. But the speed of information is much different now. Harry and Meghan are able to call out the disinformation in real time. And if Charles wasn't behind the leak, if Charles wasn't intentionally using Harry as a scapegoat once again, if Charles were a decent father, he would put out a statement setting the record straight. But he hasn't. Nothing. As usual, Buckingham Palace declined to comment. But as Harry has said, any time they declined to comment, it's because they already did. The entire article was them commenting. Harry is no longer the traumatized boy who believed that deep down, his family always had his best interest at heart. Harry's no longer playing their game. He can and does refute their lies in real time, and his statements, his corrections of the record, travel just as far and just as fast as their false stories. And Charles looks foolish. This whole story is yet again just mischief making on the part of the palace. Um, and of course, Fleet Street and the media lap it up because Harry and Meghan are clickbait. They sell newspapers and you put Harry and Meghan, Duchess of Sussex, Duke of Sussex, and then everybody just takes an interest. This is um, a family event, obviously still a public event because it's Charles, a 75th birthday is a, is a big uh, um, celebration. But if they haven't been invited, why on earth would they rock up and, and gate crash it? That there's a, mm. Can you imagine that? That just wouldn't happen. And the, the thing is, you talk about the horrendous things that, mm -hmm. that um, Harry uh, has said about his family. Mm 
Um, have you read Spare? Mm, yes, yeah, and I've listened to it too. Yeah, but so don't you agree that he has ev he had every right to say what he did? Because w w there seems to be that, that, that what he has done wrong in his father's eyes is to criticise Camilla. Now, Camilla, as far as Charles is concerned, is non-negotiable. Um, Charles's main thrust in life, um, the ten, last 10, 15, well, since the 90s, since, since the 90s when Diana died, was to make Camilla acceptable to the public and, to, and, 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 and beyond. And it took years and years and years of palace spinning and, and um, wonderful PR. I think the guy was called Mark Bolland, um, who was the, 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 P, the PR chief. Uh, and eventually, I mean, the royal fact the Queen didn't accept the Queen would never go anywhere where she wasn't in public. And eventually she accepted that, OK, this, Camilla's part of the deal. And then she also said, uh, before she died, that Camilla could be Queen Consort. Well, that's out of the window. And then there was Camilla crowned, which actually still makes my toes curl up inside my shoes. The Times saying that Harry had been invited to celebrate the King's 75th birthday next Tuesday and that he had declined. This obviously pressed all sorts of buttons in California and unusually Harry's official spokesman came out and made it very clear that he wasn't even aware there was any celebrations going on. What was extraordinary was um, his decision to let his spokesman comment on it. I mean, they could have easily just ignored it, couldn't they? <laughs> Shrugged their shoulders, and, but instead they got involved and that, that gave it a whole new lease of life. And I think- Oh, Harry should just say, ah, forget about it. They just lied about me. So let me just let it, let it go through. I mean, it just shows you to my mind that um, Harry's got a lot of time on his hands if he can be bothered to engage with something relatively trivial as this. I mean, he really should rise above this kind of stuff. Of course. You know what will be even better than Harry rise above the light? The tabloid telling the truth, not telling lies, not constantly creating stories to sell papers. You don't think that will be even better? Housemates are talking about the royal family. I'm a Prince Harry girl, in case you didn't know. Mm, I love Meghan Markle's wedding dress. It was so nice. She just looks so classic. I think the royal family drama makes me laugh, though. I just think it must be very hard to be a royal in the modern day because people, there's like less of a boundary nowadays. It just made me think like, if, imagine Diana like inserted into this right now. Yeah. She would be like a, a style icon. Like If she was still alive right now and she was the queen, the royal family would still be popular amongst I people. I know. Yeah. As in, because people like anyone can relate to her. Mm -hmm. I think all black people love Diana because she um, did a lot of work with black people. And, and like the gays mm -hmm. can relate to her as well. Like she is literally. She the had best. the blacks, the gays, the ill people, she had everyone. All the marginalized groups in her hand. That's why I felt like really like rejuvenated when Meghan Markle joined the royal family. Same. I was like, oh my god, this is finally a royal yeah. family that I can get mm -hmm. on board with. Until after a year, she had to flee the country because the media started saying and that she was like... And then they were even like, mean when she left. It's like, they I were know. angry when yeah. she was staying. Then they're angry she's leaving. I'm like, you want to hate her in close proximity? They're like, get back here. Okay, you said she is not a veteran. Harry should be up in front, not her. Again. I don't know what you guys is theory of logic I, I listen listen okay they are a married couple here in the United States we don't think the way you think I don't even know like I don't it's it's nothing about she's not a veteran okay just let me just say this Megan has always represented our troops Way before Harry, way before Harry. This is this is this is who she was before Harry. Okay, guys. And now that Meghan and Harry are together, you guys are so bent, like so obsessed. If Harry protects his wife, um, lets her like you know in front, like why does that matter to you guys? They're happy. I know it's hard for you guys to, to, to grasp for some reason. I don't know why it upsets you guys so much. I get that, you know, you don't get that feels from those people on the other side because, again, he's not a puppet no more. 
he's everything that his mother wanted her sons to be. And only one became that way. And that was Harry. Because at the end of the day, this is what a married couple looks like. Yeah. I mean, my husband, whenever we're at a event, so I can see, so I can be up front, I'm up in front of him. They're both representing this event. Why is that so hard for you to understand? I, I It's just, I don't know. I just, I, I don't get your logical ways of, yeah. But again, Megan, before Harry, okay? She was doing this kind of things before Harry. And she's, that's, I think that's why they make such a good fit. Because there's so much in common together, you know what I mean? But for some reason, people like you that come onto my page, you have to leave these remarks and I don't know. It's just, yeah, sad. Because honestly, you know, those smiles, yeah, the, the media wants to show you different, but that's the true thing. Anyway, bye. This week, Harry and Meghan are focused on celebrating veterans and service members. Beginning on Tuesday, during the 17th annual Stand Up For Heroes event in New York, Harry shared a video message from his home in Montecito. His message began with some self-deprecating humor, poking fun at himself for being a ginger, and sarcastically saying he never receives any scrutiny. But after a bit of prompting from an off-screen Megan, he got to his real message, reminding veterans of how special and valued they are. He spoke of their interconnectedness and how proud he is to be a part of this community. On Wednesday morning, Harry and Megan spent time at Camp Pendleton in San Diego. While there, they interacted with members of Operation Biggs, a mentoring program specifically for children of military families. And Wednesday evening, Harry and Meghan joined the Navy SEAL Foundation, along with 250 Naval Special Warfare personnel and their families in downtown San Diego for the opening of the Warrior Fitness Program West Coast facility. The Navy SEAL Foundation said that this facility will help active duty and veterans heal physically and mentally from combat. Following the ribbon cutting, Harry and Meghan joined a roundtable discussion and participated in the reception for the building opening. And one of the things that stood out to me the most was the notable difference in how the U.S. news outlets were reporting this event in contrast to the U.K. tabloids. The U.S. outlets focused on facts and highlighting the specific cause, which in comparison shows just how far from actual journalism the U.K. media has moved. Program is about a six to four between six and four weeks, really focusing on all seals that are veterans or currently enlisted, keeping them in shape, keeping them healthy, keeping them strong. And this is what former seal and really the project manager of the Navy SEAL Foundation, Tony Dunsty, had to say about how special it was to have the Prince and Princess of Sussex. We're thrilled that the Duke and Duchess are here. It's quite an honor for them to be here for the commissioning. They've proven through the Archwell Foundation their commitment to veteran causes domestically and internationally. Specifically, they've really destigmatized mental health issues for those who have gone through military service. And they've done that with courage. And it's just great validation to have them here. It's a great signal of partnership internationally. And we're honored to have them. Also, you just know that a lot of teacups were broken when they heard Megan referred to as a princess. And today, Scotty's Little Soldiers, a UK-based organization, shared a letter that the Duke of Sussex wrote for children who have lost a parent to military service. They also announced that while Prince Harry has been a supporter of the charity since 2017, he recently became their first ever global ambassador. This new role will allow him to give the children more of a voice and to reach more families but also to discover opportunities for collaboration and growth in the global military community. These events celebrating the military community come just as we approach an important military holiday this weekend. For those in the United States, Saturday, November 11th is known as Veterans Day. And for those in the UK or the Commonwealth, it is Remembrance Day. 
but no matter what you call it, the day is reserved each year as a dedication to those who are brave enough to serve. While living in the UK, Harry would typically mark the occasion with the annual laying of a wreath. Meghan attended this event with him in both 2018 and in 2019. However, on Remembrance Day 2020, Harry and Meghan were in the U.S., so Harry reached out to request that a wreath be laid in his honor, and if you remember from Spare, this is how that request went. Just before Remembrance Day, I'd asked the palace if someone could lay a wreath for me at the Cenotaph, since, of course, I couldn't be there. Request denied. In that case, I said, could a wreath be laid somewhere else in Britain on my behalf? Request denied. In that case, I said, perhaps a wreath could be laid somewhere in the Commonwealth, anywhere at all, on my behalf. Request denied. Nowhere in the world would any proxy be permitted to lay any sort of wreath at any military grave on behalf of Prince Harry, I was told. I pleaded that this would be the first time I'd let a Remembrance Day pass without paying tribute to the fallen, some of whom had been dear friends. Request denied. In the end, I rang one of my old instructors at Sandhurst and asked him to lay my wreath for me. He suggested the Iraq and Afghanistan Memorial in London, which had just been unveiled a few years earlier by Granny. Yes, that's perfect. Thank you. He said it would be his honour. Then added, and by the by, Captain Wales, fuck this. It's proper wrong. That year, Harry and Meghan laid a wreath at a cemetery in Los Angeles, with much criticism about them trying to upstage the royal family. So it seems that three years later, not much has changed at all. I cannot understand the amount of criticism that the UK media and the royal family have for Harry, an actual veteran who dedicates so much of his time to the military community, his community. Criticism over laying a wreath on Remembrance Day criticism over not wearing a meaningless ribbon with Charles and Camilla's faces on it, and criticism because they fear that his authenticity will always overshadow their charade. Speaking of charades, in my opinion, Kate wearing this uniform is not okay. And the fact that there are people actually criticizing Meghan for wearing a poppy, but are saying nothing about Kate gleefully wearing a military uniform incorrectly to play soldier is yet another glaring double standard. And I am not at all interested in the argument that Kate has an honorary rank or title, because to people who actually served, that means nothing. I remember one of my military training instructors saying to me to pay attention when people walk in a room and notice who people stand up for because they have to and who people stand up for because they want to. Kate can use her meaningless title to make people stand for her. But with Harry and Meghan, uniform or not, people stand because they want to. Each year since they left the UK, since the firm denied Harry's request to honor his friends and fallen soldiers, Harry and Meghan have found ways to mark Remembrance Day or Veterans Day. And this year, with the events of this week, is clearly no different as they continue to use their platform to shine a light on the military community and the organizations that support service members. And I've said this before, but I want to say it again because I am so grateful to them. I cannot think of anyone else with a platform like theirs who so consistently and genuinely highlights the struggles and successes of the global military community in the way that Harry and Meghan do, proving yet again that service truly is universal. I see English roses trending on Twitter. People are saying... Why couldn't Prince Harry choose an English rose like his brother did? Well, maybe, just maybe, Prince Harry wants to be loyal to his wife. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Also, hit that notification bell.